Steve sat in front of the TV, staring at a late night talk show without really watching it. Victoria stood in the doorway in her bathrobe and pajamas. Honey, are you coming to bed? Sure, Steve said, raising the remote to click off the TV. I thought I might make myself some warm milk first, though, you know, to try to relax. You definitely need to relax, Victoria said. Have some milk, and then maybe I'll give you a shoulder, mass shoulder massage. That would be nice, Steve said absently. Procrastinating going to bed had become a habit with him. It made sense, really. The less time he'd spent sleeping, the fewer nightmares he'd have. He drank his warm milk and let Victoria knead his shoulders. Both of these things seemed relaxing at the time he was doing them, but as soon as his head hit the pillow, his body felt like one big ball of tension. It was worse than that. It was terror. He lay there, his eyes wide open, fighting sleep. Then he heard it. The whirring. The rumbling. They were inside the walls. And this wasn't a nightmare because he knew he had never fallen asleep. Whatever it was that was after him was inside the walls, scurrying, scratching, and looking for a way out. He felt a sudden need to flee the bedroom. But when he stood in the doorway, he heard more rustling and rattling coming from the living room. So they were there, too. He backed up and tried to close the bedroom door, but it was useless. There was no way to lock yourself in and keep intruders out. No one was safe. Steve and his family were sitting ducks, all of them. A loud bump came from the bedroom wall on Steve's left. He turned to look at it. The surface of the wall began to pulse and throb, forming a large bubble on the surface that reminded Steve of the way cheese bubbles up on a pizza. Then, with a wet splat, the bubble popped like a zit, and an oily black substance splattered across the room. Steve needed to get out of there. He needed to get Victoria out of there. How could she be sleeping through this? He ran over to her side of the bed and shook her shoulder. Victoria, wake up! What is it? Are the kids okay? Victoria sat up, rubbing her eyes. Unable to find words, Steve pointed at the wall, which now had a gaping hole out of which the black slime oozed. What? Victoria said. Why do you want me to look at the wall? Don't you see it? Steve said. The black slime was dripping from the hole onto the floor. Victoria took his hand. Honey, you're having a nightmare. Lie back down. I'm not having a nightmare because I'm not asleep, Steve yelled. He never raised his voice to his wife or her kids, but he was freaking out. I know it feels that way because you're walking and talking, Victoria said. But if you lie down and close your eyes, it'll all go away. Desperate to escape his terror, Steve let himself be coaxed into lying back down. He closed his eyes feeling how tired he was, how much his body longed for rest. But the noises in the walls didn't stop. There would be no sleep for him tonight. This is DJ Dan the Music Man, the voice on the radio said. We've got heavy snow coming on right now. No time to go out and buy milk and bread. Just stay at home and stay safe. <laughs> DJ Dan the Music Man, that's so good. Abigail looked out the window and announced, He's right. It's snowing! By morning, the yard and surrounding woods were covered in a heavy blanket of snow. The grass and trees looked like they'd been covered in a thick layer of white cake frosting. At first it was fun. They played board games, made popcorn and drank hot chocolate. It all felt very cosy. The trouble was the snow didn't stop. It kept falling, wet and heavy, and the temperature plummeted, so it was too frigid for anyone to stay outside for long. Beneath the snow, the roads were a solid sheet of ice. As a result, they were trapped in the house, which was the last place Steve wanted to be. Because they were there. They were always there, even though he only heard them at night. Sometimes, though he would never say it to Victoria because he knew how delusional it sounded, it felt like they had, ha had made the snow happen because it put Steve there in the house, right where they wanted him. The ringing was getting worse too. The high-pitched sound was always in his head, day and night. Just like the house, he couldn't escape it. It was day five of the blizzard and the snowfall was still heavy. Steve, Victoria and the kids were sitting around the dinner table eating macaroni and cheese and canned green beans Victoria had tried to jazz up with salt, butter and dill. I know this morning... Uh, sorry. I know this meal isn't up to my usual standards of cooking, Victoria said. But I'm having to dig through the pantry for food since we can't get out to the grocery store. 
I could eat mac and cheese every day, Abigail said. One of the two kids, she was the pickier eater. Uh, of the two kids, she was the pickier eater. I'm sure you could, Victoria said, but I bet your daddy would rather have a steak and some salad. Actually, I'm kind of digging the mac and cheese, Steve said. It was comfort food, and he certainly needed comfort, more than mere food could provide. Say, when was the last time you checked the weather? Not since this morning, Victoria said. Unless you count uh, looking out the window. Just what we needed, the DJ said in his fake shipper voice. I don't know what this is supposed to mean, but I'm doing the, this voice because I really like doing this voice. <laughs> had, somebody, had somebody turned on the radio? More snow! The National Weather Service is calling for at least three more inches tomorrow with a high of 15 degrees. It's going to be up to our eyeballs, people. This is DJ Dan, the music man, staying safe. Say, ah, oh, damn it. Saying stay home and stay safe. Victoria got up and switched off the radio. You know, I've lived in this area all my life, and I've never seen snow like this, Steve said. Back when he was at school, they went whole winters without having any snow days. I know, it's like we're at the North Pole, v Victoria said. Then where's Santa? Abigail said. Victoria laughed. That's an excellent question. If we're stuck in the house, then we deserve presents. Christmas in February! Abigail's innocent question made Steve want to cry. Where was Santa indeed? Santa was a symbol of hope, and Steve had lost all hope. Haunted, hunted, trapped. And not only trapped, but trapped in a dangerous place. Victoria and the kids seemed to think they were safe in the house, but Steve knew better. He stood up from the table. I think I'm going to work for a couple more hours. Are you sure? Victoria said. You've been working all day, and I promised the kids would watch a movie together. You guys go ahead and get the movie started. I'll be down in a bit. Steve knew he was too distracted, too much of a mess to focus on a movie. Right now the only thing he seemed to be able to focus on was work. He had already completed the first game, so that one was down. Once he submitted all four games, he'd get a big payout from Fazbear Entertainment. Their financial worries would be over and they could move somewhere else, somewhere safe, where they could be happy together. Nightmare fuel. He had heard that phrase used to describe a variety of scary images, creepy clowns and dolls especially, but what Steve was doing was using his nightmares as fuel to power his games. The strange noises and sights, the ongoing feeling of being watched and tracked. He poured all of it into the game. And somehow when he was working, he could almost convince himself that he had control over the forces that terrified him at night. Almost, but not quite. He knew he was spinning out of control, and sometimes he was afraid he had spun so far out, he would never find his way back again. Steve fell into the game, uh, sorry, Steve fell into game two and lost track of time. Once he climbed down the ladder, the house was silent. Victoria and the kids were all in bed. Steve decided a hot shower might soothe him put him in a position to get some sleep. He struggled to remember the last time he had gotten a real night of sleep. Steve regarded himself in the bathroom mirror. He looked awful. His face was greyish and stubbly. His eyes were bloodshot with dark pouches beneath them. But what scared him most was not the signs of exhaustion, but the wildness in his eyes, as if he were a trapped animal. Who was he kidding? He was a trapped animal. As he took off his shirt, he felt a small pain in his right forearm. He looked at it and saw a small, shallow cut. The kind of cut one might get from shaving from a shaving accident. But that made no sense, since he didn't shave his forearms. Examining himself further, he found several small cuts and abrasions on both arms and his chest and belly. He racked his brain, trying to figure out where these injuries could have come from. It wasn't like he had a dangerous job. It was pretty hard to hurt yourself sitting in front of a computer all day. The kids had begged him to play Tickle Monster after lunch, and he had obliged, but it wasn't like the kids carried or wore anything sharp or dangerous. Of course, deep down he knew that the kids weren't the source of his injuries. The source of his wounds was the same as the source of the high-pitched ringing that was inside his head day and night. But as annoying as the ringing was, the cuts and scrapes were worse. They meant that it wasn't just that something wanted to hurt him, something was hurting him. Steve stepped into the steaming shower, the hot water stung his cuts and abrasions. If there was an upside to his wounds, 
It was that they were physical evidence that he wasn't just having night terrors, as Victoria kept insisting. The objects of his terror were real. Sleep was not an option, so after his shower, Steve sat on the living room couch, not watching TV, not reading, just sitting and waiting for the intruders to make their presence known. For a while, there was nothing. Then, he saw the glow of light that came on when someone opened the refrigerator door in the kitchen. There was the slamming of the kitchen cabinet doors. He got up and ran to the kitchen, ready to face whoever or whatever was making the noise. Avery was standing beside the kitchen sink. Why did the sight of his own son in the kitchen, in the dark kitchen, make him uneasy? Why aren't you in bed, buddy? Steve asked. He could hear a nervous quaver in his own voice. Hi, Daddy. I'm thirsty, Avery said. Here, I'll get you a glass of water, but then you have to go back to bed. Okay, Daddy. Steve's hand shook as he held the glass under the faucet. Avery took the glass and sipped it, uh, and sipped from it once then set it down and toddled back toward his room. Maybe Steve was having some kind of mental breakdown. The noises he had heard in the kitchen couldn't possibly have been made by a two-year-old child, though, could they? Hmm, maybe none of the sounds he was hearing were real, but the cuts and scrapes were real, weren't they? He went back into the living room and sank to the couch. Outside, the snow made everything silent, and inside, everyone but him seemed to be soundly asleep. It would have been peaceful if he hadn't been so terrified. Then the noise started, a scrambling and skittering inside the living room walls. Steve put his hands over his ears. Stop it, stop it, he begged, rocking back and forth in some primal attempt to comfort himself. The walls around him pulsated. A hole appeared in the wall nearest him like a fist had punched through it. But what Steve saw emerging from the hole was not a fist. It was the head, the head of something. It was small, but bulbous and veined, its large eyes almond-shaped with cat-like pupils. It lunged forward from the hole in the wall and parted its jaws to reveal a mouthful of sharp-looking teeth. Its pointed tongue darted out like a snake's when it sniffed the air. Steve was paralysed with fear. The only part of him that felt like it was moving was his heart hammering in his chest. The creature's tongue shot further out, impossibly far, it seemed, and pierced the skin of Steve's, of Steve's forearm like the hypodermic needle. The pain was intense. Had the thing poisoned him? He looked at his arm, and he saw a small red puncture wound with a bruise already forming around it. Holding his injured arm, he ran from the living room down the hall. The walls in the hallway pulsed too, and another hole appeared. A green serpent-like head poked out of the hole, its scales a metallic green. It opened its mouth and puked up a large tangle of snakes. The snakes landed on the floor, undulated out of their knot, and slithered around Steve's feet. Steve hated snakes. He lifted his feet out of the snake pile and ran to the bedroom. Since the door didn't close or lock properly, he propped a chair up against it. Victoria sat up in bed. Steve, what in the world? Steve was panting. It was hard to find words. They're coming out of the walls. Some kind of monsters or aliens or something. And snakes. The hall is full of snakes. He knew how crazy he sounded, but he also knew what he had seen. Sit down, Victoria said. Take deep breaths. Steve's breathing was fast and shallow. He sat on the bed and tried to slow things down. Do you want me to look out in the hall? Victoria asked. No. Steve yelled louder than he'd meant to. The snakes. The snakes will get in. I think we're okay with the door closed. I don't think they can get underneath it. His wife looked at him with a mixture of fear and pity. I think the stress of developing these games is getting to you, sweetheart. That and the financial pressure and the fact that we've not been able to leave the house for so long. But I promise you, honey, there can't be snakes in the hallway. It's winter time. The snakes are hibernating. The ones in our hallway aren't, Steve said. They're wide awake. Look. I understand that you don't think any of this is real. He started unbuttoning his pyjama top. But look at these! You can't tell me that these aren't real! He held out his hat, his scratched, cut, and punctured bare arms. Oh, my poor darling! Victoria said, unshed tears sparkling in her eyes. Just a second, I'll be right back. She disappeared into the bathroom and returned with a tube of antibiotic ointment. She sat next to him on the bed, and started dabbing the medicine on his cuts and scrapes. As soon as the snow melts, 
We're going to get you some help. He knew she didn't mean regular medical help. She meant psychiatric help. She didn't believe him. She was the one person whose trust he counted on, and she didn't believe him. Steve put his head in his hands. He had lived a lonely life before Victoria and the kids, but somehow he had never felt more alone than he did right now. Lie down, Victoria said, gently pushing him back on the bed. You need to rest. Steve lay down, but he did not rest. Even though the house was quiet now, the high-pitched ringing in his head was deafening. What a great section of the story. <laughs> that is amazing. This is terrifying, by the way. <laughs> the snakes, oh my gosh. Okay. In the morning, Steve, head still ringing, opened the bedroom door with a great deal of trepidation, expecting to see the floor squirming with snakes. But the floor looked completely normal, and there was no hole in the wall in the spot where Steve remembered the serpent-like creature poking out its head. Maybe Victoria was right. Maybe he did need help. The smells of coffee and bacon were wafting from the kitchen, and Steve was surprised to find the aromas pleasant, despite his damaged emotional state. Besides, he had to eat to keep up his strength. He had to, fi he had to work to finish the games. If he finished the games, then he'd have the money to leave if the snowstorm ever stopped. Victoria was standing at the stove in her bathrobe, simultaneously scrambling eggs and tending to a pan of sizzling bacon. The kids were already at the table with their glasses of orange juice. They were always in such a good mood in the morning. Victoria smiled at him as if everything was normal. Get us some coffee, why don't you? She said. The radio was on, as it always seemed to be these days, so they could keep track of the weather. After a disconcertingly happy-sounding pop song finished playing, the DJ said, DJ Dan the Music Man here, and I've got good news and bad news, folks. The good news is that the chance of precipitation today is just 30%, but the bad news is that the temperature won't get above 30 degrees. We might not get any more snow, but the snow we do have isn't going anywhere. So stay inside and stay safe, and I'll keep spinning tunes to help you happy. So, oh god, to help you happy? To keep you happy. And now, by special request, here's the latest hit from Sailor Thrift. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes! <coughs> oh, doing that voice makes my throat go so sore. We got a Taylor Swift parody? What? <laughs> um, Steve's hand shook as he lifted the pot and poured the coffee into cups. He put milk in Victoria's coffee the way she liked it and sat down with the kids. He tried to act normal, but he knew he was failing. What's wrong, Daddy? Abigail asked. There you had it. He couldn't act normal enough to fool a four-year-old. Nothing, honey, he said. I'm just tired. I didn't sleep very well last night. Why? Avery asked. He was getting into the why stage. Because there are monsters in the walls, Steve thought. But there was no way he was going to say that to a two-year-old. Instead, he said, I don't know, buddy. Sometimes I just can't sleep. He ate the bacon and eggs and toast mechanically, the same way he put gas into his car. He needed the fuel to keep going, to do what he had to do, which was finish the games. As soon as he shallow uh, shallowed? As soon as he swallowed the last mouthful of food, he chugged the remains of his coffee and got up to go climb the ladder to work. When he first started working on the games, climbing the ladder into the attic had felt like he was entering the, the darkness. The horrific world he was creating on the screen as he sat in the windowless attic was a stark contrast to the happiness and light radiated by his wife and children in the rest of the house. But now the darkness was spilling over into everything. The only time the high-pitched ringing in his head stopped was when he was working on the game. Or maybe it didn't stop, but the game was the only thing that distracted him from the sound. The hours fell away as Steve worked. He was on game number three now. When Victoria called up at him that it was time for lunch, he had been so immersed that he jumped and gasped as he thought, uh, as, as though he had been started by a monster instead of his wife. Sorry. Not hungry, he called back. Going to work until dinner time. Okay, Victoria replied. Let me know if you need anything. He didn't answer because he had already fallen back into the game. Victoria had made spaghetti for dinner again with garlic bread. Abigail and Avery, their mouths and chins dark orange with sauce, slurped the long noodles and giggled. 
Victoria was always kind and supportive, and her cooking was always delicious, even now that she was limited to their pantry ingredients because they'd been snowed in for so long. The children were great too. Great? The children were great too. Starting to g gain a lisp while reading this. Um, they were charming and cheerful, and never fought like Steve had with his siblings when he was a kid. Steve knew he could have a perfect life with them if they could just get away from this place, this snowbound house of horrors that quite possibly was driving him insane. But he had the power to get them out, he reminded himself. He was over halfway finished with the game. You're quiet tonight, Victoria said. Sorry, Steve twirled some spaghetti around his fork. I'm just having a hard time getting my head out of the game. Is it going well? she asked, reaching over to dab at Avery's orange face with a napkin. Steve nodded. No matter how unstable and terrified he was in his regular life, somehow his work on the games was really, really good. Can we play them when, we're, when they're ready? Abigail asked. You can play them when you're a little older, Steve said. Right now, they're too scary for you. Sometimes I feel like they're too scary for me, too. Abigail and Avery giggled. To them, the idea of a grown-up being scared was so unimaginable that it was funny. After the kids had bathed and gone to bed, Victoria and Steve cuddled on the couch with the radio playing softly in the background. Even with the volumes lowered, even with the volume lowered, Steve could hear DJ Dan's familiar voice saying, Even more snow tonight, folks. It looks like we're going to have a white Valentine's Day. If we keep up at this rate, we might have a white St. Patrick's Day too. Because he was stuck in the house all the time, the dates tended to run together. Steve had forgotten that the next day was Valentine's Day. I'm so sorry that I've not been able to get you anything for Valentine's Day, Steve said as he stroked, uh, as he stroked Victoria's lustrous hair. Victoria laughed. There's no need to apologise. You can't go shopping for cards when you can't get out of the house. The kids are going to make cards out of construction paper tomorrow. Maybe you can make me one too. Just be neater with the glitter than they are. Cleaning up that stuff is a nightmare. You deserve more than a card, Steve said, swept up, as he often was, by Victoria's sheer wonderfulness. It was rare for a person to be equally beautiful on the outside and the inside, but she was. You deserve red roses and chocolates and a nice piece of jewellery. Shh, Victoria said, putting her index finger gently against his lips. You're the only Valentine's pre Day present I need. <coughs> oh, it's gross. <laughs> I have no idea how I got so lucky, Steve said. Victoria smiled. I feel the same way. The radio was playing a song that Steve had already heard twice that day by Taylor Sw uh, Sailor Thrift. No, I'm joking. That was always the problem with Top 40 Radio. They played the same songs over and over. And to be honest, he was getting a little sick of DJ Dan too. Didn't that station have any other DJs? <laughs> DJ Dan seemed to work all hours of the night and day. I love how this is like a main plot point now. It's so funny. Steve stood up and walked over to the window where the radio sat on the sill. Hey, if you don't mind, I'm going to change the station. Oh, d don't do that, said Victoria. Her tone sounded casual on the surface, but there was tension underneath. Why not? Steve said. He was already fiddling with the knob. I'm in the mood for some classic rock, and I'm sure any station we listen to will have updates on the weather. But he couldn't seem to find another station. When he turned it away from the usual pop station, there wasn't even static, only silence. Huh. That's weird. That's what I was trying to tell you, Victoria said. It's hard to get a signal out here in the country. For some reason, that pop station's the only one we can re get reliably. We really are in the middle of nowhere, aren't we? Steve said, giving up and turning back to the pop station. No cell phone service? One radio station? Yeah, Victoria said. But I like it. It's peaceful. Steve had felt anything but peaceful lately. But don't you ever feel trapped? Especially right now when we've been snowed in so long. Victoria smiled. Well, I'd be lying if I said I wouldn't like to be able to go out to the store and maybe grab a pizza somewhere. But overall, I think being snowed in with you and the kids is cosy. Steve couldn't believe he'd gotten so lucky. Why would a woman like Victoria even give him the time of day? Well, there's no one I'd rather be snowed in with than you. They kissed. And Victoria said, I think I'm going on to bed. How about you? Steve's stomach became a knot of tension at the thought of lying awake in bed and listening to the noises, waiting to see if something burst out of the walls. 
waiting to see if the monsters just wanted to scare him or do him lasting, maybe lethal harm. I'll be along in a bit, he said. Well, don't stay up all night, Victoria said, getting up from the couch. Sleep deprivation isn't good for your health, physical or mental. I know, Steve said. He was shaky, exhausted, and in a dead panic most of the time. He didn't need to be told his physical and mental health was suffering. Believe me, I know. I promise I'll try to get some sleep tonight. Once Victoria was gone, it was like he had lost his safety net and was being plunged into darkness. There was a scraping sound in the walls, like something with sharp claws was inside them. The ringing in his head became so loud it drowned out the music on the radio. He couldn't sit here and be alone. It was so, so much worse when he was alone. The only time he could bear to be alone was when he was working on the game. He was on the last game now. He just had to see it through. He should go to bed. Even though he knew he couldn't sleep, at least Victoria would be there beside him. <clears throat> Here we go. This is the good bit. As he walked down the hall, the walls pulsated, and the ceiling buckled so it looked like the underside of a hammock. The lowest part of the ceiling cracked, then opened wider, and from the hole emerged a spider the size of a basketball, which dangled just above him from a tendril of web. It was black and hairy, fanged and many-eyed. Beside its fangs were pincers, which it rubbed together menacingly. Steve stood still, afraid to move or even breathe. How could a spider be so big? Was it venomous? If it was, it was probably packing enough venom to kill a herd of elephants. And then the huge spider's abdomen split open. Out of the opening fell hundreds, maybe thousands, of small spiders like candy falling from a piñata. Steve was covered in spiders. They were in his hair, on his face, and on his hands and arms. They were crawling into his ears, his nose, and his mouth. He screamed and slapped at them with both hands, slapped himself all over, over and over again, in hopes of squishing them. Victoria came running. What is it? Steve didn't want to talk, because he didn't want more spiders to crawl in his mouth, but he managed to say through clenched teeth, Spiders! They're all over me! Victoria looked confused and a little alarmed. She took Steve's arm. No! Don't touch me! They're going on you too! Victoria drew her hands back in a gesture of surrender. Okay, but come with me. I need to see you in the light. Still slapping himself all over, Steve followed her into the bedroom. She looked him up and down. Honey, I don't know how to tell you this, because I know it's real to you. But I don't see any spiders. But how can you not? They're all over... Steve looked down at his arms, his hands, his shirt. The spiders were gone. He sat down on the edge of his bed. They were here. They were here. The ringing sound in his head was getting louder and louder, like an ambulance announcing the presence of an emergency. This place. It's making me crazy, he said, on the verge of tears. He stood up. I have to get out of here. I have to get out of here for a while, even if it's just going for a walk in the snow. No, Victoria said. It's too cold out there, and the snow's too deep. It's not safe. But Steve was already halfway down the hall. The ringing in his head was, was growing unbearably loud, like a smoke detector designed to wake up everybody in a burning house. A smoke detector? That was exactly what it sounded like. Steve looked at the smoke detector mounted on the ceiling in the living room. Something inside him said, If you disable the smoke alarm, the sound will stop. As the ringing in his head continued, he grabbed a poker from the fireplace and hit the smoke alarm with it until he knocked it down onto the floor. He continued beating it with the poker, then jumped up and down on it several times for good measure until it was smashed into pieces. At first, there was silence, silence and relief. But then Steve became aware that although he was finally silent in his head, he was still surrounded by noise. There was the din of the ever-present DJ Dan on the radio prattling on about the never-ending snowstorm. But there was another sound too. It was different than what he was used to hearing in the house though. It wasn't scraping or scuttling, but a variety of mechanical sounds. Wheels turning, gears grinding. It sounded like he was on the production floor of a small factory. The sounds weren't the only things that were different. The house looked different too. The furniture was the same. 
but there were strange tread marks on the floor. Hinged trapdoors were on the walls and ceiling in the exact places where the creatures had jumped out at him. It was like being inside an, an, amusement, parts, uh, an amusement park's haunted house with the lights turned on. He heard more whirring, but whatever was making it was moving toward him from the hallway. He looked around for a hiding place and finally ducked into the coat closet. He tried to pull the closet door shut, but like every other door in this in infernal house, it wouldn't close all the way. He ducked behind the hangers of coats and jackets, his heart pounding. Honey, where are you? Victoria's voice called. You didn't go for a walk in the snow, did you? Her voice was coming from the living room, but he couldn't hear her footsteps, only a motorised whirring sound. Steve peeked out from behind the coats, or from between the coats. Standing in the living room was a robot. <laughs> it was all steel, with visible wires and circuits. The only part of it that faintly resembled a human being was its face, a mask of plastic with feminine features. Steve? Victoria's voice was coming from inside the robot. Steve, I know you must still be here because you're... Snow boots are in are beside the door. Where are you, sweetheart? Steve's first thought when seeing the robot was, What have you done to Victoria? And why do you have her voice? But it didn't take long for reality to set in. The robot hadn't done anything to Victoria. The robot was Victoria. Or at least it was what he had been calling Victoria for the past few weeks. Or months. Or however long he'd been trapped here. Steve felt like he might be sick, but he couldn't let himself throw up. If he threw up, he would make a sound, which would ruin his hiding place. He thought of the games of hide and seek he had played with the children, full of fun and laughter, so different from the hiding he was doing now. Wait, the children. The children are in danger from this terrifying thing they thought they were, was their mother. I have to save them. Mummy, where's Daddy? Abigail's voice called. Daddy, Daddy! Avery called. Steve peeked out again from between the coats. What he saw made him shiver, as though the temperature in the room had just dropped 40 degrees. The children were robots too. Smaller ones, but also with plastic mask faces, with wide robotic eyes and exposed mechanical parts. They moved jerkily around the room, looking behind curtains and under tables, calling, Daddy! Daddy! When Steve didn't respond, the robots stopped using their human voices and began to search more aggressively, with only the soundtrack of whirring machinery and the pop radio station in the background. The three robots picked up furniture like it was nothing heavier than a pile of sticks. They opened and looked inside the trapdoors, even though the spaces were much too small for him to hide in. It was only a matter of time until one of them looked inside the coat closet. What would they do when they found him? Steve feared for his life. The pop song on the radio ended, and DJ Dan said, Stay in and stay safe. Well, everybody except you, Steve. Steve shook his head, as if to jar his brain awake. This was impossible. None of it could be happening. Steve, buddy, you need to come out, the familiar voice from the radio said. Your family is looking for you. Playtime's over, Steve. Victoria, Abigail, Avery. They're all getting worried about you. You don't want to worry your beautiful wife and children, do you? Through the coats, he watched the animatronic trio go into the kitchen. He knew he couldn't stay in the, clo in the coat closet forever. If he made it to the bedroom, he could get his car keys. He didn't know how well he'd be able to drive in such deep snow. But it was his only shot, so he at least had to try. He ducked out of the coat closet and ran down the hall toward the bedroom. But then he heard the whirring of machinery again and knew they were in the living room. He darted into the bathroom, stepped into the tub, and pulled the shower curtain in front of him. He was out of breath from exertion and terror. Steve! Steve, honey! It was Victoria's voice coming from the hall. Then he heard the sound of her metal feet on the bathroom tile. The steps grew closer and closer. In one great sweeping motion, his robot wife ripped the shower curtain from the rings holding it in place, Steve was exposed, a sitting duck. He looked at the blank plastic face that was looking at him, and then, 
with more strength than he knew he possessed. He put both his hands against the robot's cold mechanical shoulders and shoved it as hard as he could. The force threw the robot off balance, making it fall forward. Steve leaped from the tub, ran past the robot that was already working on writing itself, and made it to the bedroom, shutting the door behind him. Everything the door didn't really shut. Uh, sorry, what? I, I don't know why I said everything there. Ow, my feet hurt. Uh, except the door didn't really shut, and in the hall he could hear the once sweet sounding, now terrifying voices of his children calling, Daddy! Daddy! <laughs> Steve leaned against the door with all his weight. He grabbed the wooden chair from the vanity and angled its back under the doorknob in hopes of making the door harder to open. But the door was the only way out of the room. How long could he hold out? The three robots were on the other side of the door pushing. He was holding them off for now, but he knew he would get tired. They wouldn't. Steve... Wait. Yeah, okay. Uh, Steve! Listen up, Steve! Steve turned his head in the direction of the adult male voice to see the, ro uh, the radio that had been in the living room now sitting on the nightstand beside the bed. Had Victoria moved it there in anticipation of Steve ending up in the bedroom? Steve, this is your buddy DJ Dan the Music Man. The voice from the radio continued. I'm here to help you, Steve. You're not going to be able to keep holding that door, buddy. Your arms are already tired, aren't they? Steve could feel the muscles in his arms quiver and weaken. He wasn't a spend hours at the gym kind of guy. He was a sit hours at the computer guy. He knew his strength was no match for the robot's steel. Still, he tried to hold on. Steve, the voice on the radio continued. Do you remember when you lived alone in your sad little apartment, working for minimum wage, trying unsuccessfully to try and get a, uh, to get a game off of the ground? Do you remember when dinner was a microwaved burrito you ate alone? And how sometimes you'd be so lonely, you'd go to the bodega and buy something random just so you could make chit-chat with the cashier. I remember, Steve said. How, mu how did the guy on the radio know so much about him? And why was the guy on the radio talking to him personally anyway? Was all this stuff real? Or had he finally reached his breaking point? And now, think about how happy you've been since you came here, DJ Dan said in his soothing voice. No one has ever had a nicer, more beautiful wife than Victoria. And your adorable kids. You always wanted to be a dad, and it's great, isn't it? But it's not real, Steve said. His whole body was pressed against the door, but the robots were standing their ground, pushing it from the other side. Sure it is, buddy. Everything you felt for your wife and kids. It was as real as it gets. You just have to give yourself permission to be happy. But the night terrors, the things in the house, those weren't real. Those were just there to inspire you while you worked on the game. Say the word and they're gone. Let go of the door, Steve, and I promise what's on the other side won't come in. You need to stop fighting this and let yourself be happy. There were tears in, Steve, in Steve's eyes. He had to admit that the moments of joy he had experienced with Victoria and the kids were greater than any other happiness he had ever known. But the moments of terror he'd experienced in this house were unsurpassed too. Everything there, uh, oh sorry, everything here, had been so much more intense than anything that had come before. He felt like all the most important moments in his life had happened here, and yet he had been in this house only a few weeks. And how do I let myself be happy? He asked. His voice sounded small, weak. It's as easy as pushing a button, DJ Dan's voice said. If you let go of the door and walk over to the radio, you'll see a red button on its side. If you push that button, you'll have everything you've ever dreamed of. The perfect woman you always wanted. The perfect children you always wanted. And guess what? No more pushing mops or scrubbing toilets for you, buddy, because you'll be one of the world's most successful video game developers. That's a lot of happiness for pushing one little button. Steve found himself holding the door less forcefully. But it's not real, he said, even though he felt his resistance weakening. Reality is what we make it, Steve, DJ Dan said. Make your own reality and make it beautiful. All you have to do is push the button. Steve thought back to his days of mop pushing and frustration and loneliness. He let go of the door, turned his back on it and faced the radio. 
You can do it, Steve, DJ Dan's voice urged him. You can live a life of bliss. Isn't that a beautiful word? Bliss. Steve moved closer to the radio. He heard a creak as the bedroom door opened behind him. There was the red button. All he had to do was push, and the fantasy would become reality. It was such a beautiful fantasy, and what favours had reality ever done for him? Steve's hand shook as he reached out toward the radio. He pushed the button. The high-pitched ringing filled Steve's head, filled the room, and seemed to fill the whole world. Steve clapped his hands over his ears, but, did, but it did nothing to muffle the horrible cacophony. He fell to his knees as the room started to spin, and then, just as suddenly, everything was still. Steve used the nightstand to steady himself as he rose to his feet. He looked around the bedroom. Everything looked normal. And then he saw her. Victoria was standing in the doorway. Her blue-black hair was like a halo around her lovely face. She was wearing the same green dress she wore the first time they met. His favourite dress. He could say she was just as beautiful as the day they met, but that would be a lie. She was even more beautiful. Victoria. He breathed her name in a reverent whisper. Sweetheart, she said, looking at him with love in her green-flecked brown eyes. She opened her arms to him. This time... Steve didn't hesitate. He went to her. He wrapped his arms around her and pressed his lips to hers. Bliss. That was the perfect word for what he was feeling. His bliss was so great that he barely felt the continuous stabbing in the vicinity of his heart. Oh my god! <laughs> this story is the best story in my opinion it's so good oh my god i had chills so many times during that story i also think i did a pretty good job of reading that to be honest that's probably one of my best audiobooks that i've done um wow what do i even say about this this story is probably my favorite story right now i'm just gonna put it out there I think it's my favourite story. Let me just have a drink of water before I say my final thoughts. Thank you for um, for listening for this long. Uh, listening through with me. Or reading through with me, whatever. Um, this story is amazing. Let me just tell you some kind of thoughts that I have about this story. Uh, and then we'll end. Basically, um, I feel like... I don't know. I don't know where to start. I honestly don't know where to start. I think that everything about the story is wonderful. It is amazingly done. Now, in terms of theorizable content, there isn't too much, except the fact that, um, you know, illusion discs in the smoke detector, I would say. And of course, he is the rogue indie developer, or supposedly he is a rogue indie developer for the FNAF VR type games, right? So I believe, that he was responsible for, in FNAF VR, he was responsible for FNAF 1, FNAF 2, FNAF 3, and Night Terrors. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because Night Terrors is what FNAF 4 is called. But the thing is, in this story, he never actually completed the fourth game. He died before completing his fourth. So, I have a feeling that that's kind of like, Night Terrors is referring to that. And there were a lot of, like, FNAF 4 parallels, as I was saying throughout the story. There was, like, hiding in the cut in the cut. well, that's, that's it, honestly. Hiding in the cupboard. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that is it. <laughs> but, um, that is amazing. Such a good story. Obviously, it doesn't have anything to do with the pizza plex, except DJ Dan the Music Man, who is an amazing character. But, I don't care if it has anything to do with the pizza plex or not. This story is straight up S tier. You cannot tell me otherwise. Guys, let me know if you would put it in the S tier as well. I think this is amazing. What do you think? Thank you so much for listening. And uh, I will see you in our next audiobook reading, hopefully. Which is Haps, which is also quite a good one. So, stay tuned for that. See you later.